around the clock and against the clock to break an agent's indecipherable. And we broke 90% of them without the agent having to repeat them. It was a huge achievement, wasn't it? No, we should have broken 100. <laughs> You're still unsatisfied to this day about what you did? Do you, still, do you still question in your own mind what you did? No more than 20 hours a day. <laughs> it took me 12 months to persuade SOE. Agents must not have poems for their codes because a Boy Scout could break them. And if they're using well-known poems, Guess what? The Germans will have The Germans them. could mathematically reconstruct the words they'd used. If they're famous words, they could read every single message an agent sent without having to break anymore. One agent used, God save the king, and God help the agent. Because all they had to do was reconstruct five words of the national anthem, and they'd know the rest. By the time you joined SOE, which was in 1942, it was clear that the system of communication was breaking down. No. You, had, you had severe no. doubts about it, on didn't you? On the contrary. Um, when I joined in, in 1942, I couldn't believe what they were using. Because I'd been taught at code-breaking school that these codes were highly insecure. And when you asked just now, whether I regretted anything. It took me 12 months to persuade SOE that agents must not use poems. They must use codes printed on silk, different for every single agent in the field. Some of which you have there, yes. which were extraordinary. So they would use these once and once only? Absolutely. They and would then destroy them? Cut them away and burn them, and then they couldn't be tortured because they couldn't remember them. And it was very difficult for the Germans to use them, pretending to be the agents. It gave them a wholly new lease of life. But if they lost their silk codes, and they frequently did, they had to rely on poems. And that's why I insisted that as many poems as possible were original compositions. Original compositions by you from your, what, what became known as your ditty box, wasn't it? Well, yes, a box I tried full of ditties. I tried to persuade the various country section heads to write some original poems. And a rumour started there's an outbreak of insanity in the code department because they couldn't understand why they had to be original compositions. And also, I wanted them written in the agent's own language. But the country sections were very reluctant to do so. So I wrote as many as I could original compositions. Tell me about one of them, because you wrote one which was picked out of a box by a very special agent, wasn't it? It was a French lady called Violette Zabo. Violette Zabo was a very beautiful French lady indeed. And in her early 20s? Yes. A shop assistant? A shop Brixton. assistant at Brixton. I think she'd always been in her early 20s. She was years ahead of her time. Cheeky, vivacious. And she had a learnt a poem that she wasn't very happy with. And I had one I thought might be suitable for her. And asked her if she were a quick learner. She asked at what subject. And then I gave it to her to read, wrote it out. And she looked at me in astonishment and said, who wrote this? And I said, I'll check up and let you know when you come back, feeling that perhaps she wouldn't. And she didn't, did she? No, but she did take the poem in with her. Will you tell us what that poem was? Would you the recite? life that I have is all that I have. And the life that I have is yours. The love that I have of the life that I have is yours and yours and yours. A sleep I shall have, a rest I shall have. Yet death will be but a pause for the peace of my years in the long green grass 
will be yours and yours and yours. Leo Marx, were you in love with her? No, not in love with her. I was in love for her. I was Sally. in love with the fact that she might come back alive. If she had a safe code, she was going in on a very dangerous mission. No, I was in love with the person for whom I originally wrote that poem. A lady called Ruth. That's right. You have read the book very slowly. Yes, a lady. sadly died in a plane crash in, in plane Canada, crash. didn't she? Yes, she did, and I went up on the roof of Norgebury House. Which was in Baker Street? Yes, where our offices were, owned by Marks and Spencer. And I looked up at the sky and thought of all the things I had never said to her. And this poem occurred. And when I was with Violet Zabo, I didn't think Ruth, that was her name, would mind if I let her use it. So I gave it to her. Violet Zabo was in fact executed, wasn't she? Oh, yes. With several other British agents. Yes. Kneeling on the ground. Kneeling on the ground, in shot in the back of the head. Yes. Concentration camp. She was. She was. You had to carry that sadness with you and the sadness of the loss of many agents during the time that you were in the Special Operations Executive. How, how did you cope with that? If you see an agent on a Monday and on a Friday read that he had had his eyes taken out with a fork. In order to survive, you become case-hardened to courage, case-hardened to loss. And all you can do is work 20, 21 hours a day to try and give them safe communications and get them back alive. But you thought, you took it all personally, didn't you? You, you cared about each one of them. It was inevitable. And the style of the book you've written in, it may be very flippant, and it is very flippant in places, and very funny, but it's a, totally at odds with the content, isn't it? Did it Some, have to be that way? Yes, because I wanted to share it with as many people as possible. And a great deal of what happened in SOE was farce. The agents were unaware of their bravery. The good ones were completely unaware. But there was fear in the briefing room, wasn't there? When you sat down with them yes. to tell them there what was they fear had to do. It was the worst kind of fear because it was never expressed, was never explicit. It was fear, not of the pain of torture. It was fear that they would fail their colleagues. The bravest of them, the bravest of them, were unaware of being brave. And I never would have had enough courage to go into the field under any circumstances. Did you feel guilty in a way that oh, you did? Oh, immensely, yes. Oh, yes. But I pretended I wanted to. And all I could do to make up for it was think, sit at the back of the back room and plan safe codes for them. Leo Marx, you were a code breaker from a very young age, weren't you? Your father owned a bookshop in the Charing Cross Road, and you used to break the price codes that were written at the back of the books, didn't you? How well, did you do that? Well, my father had no other child, and nor had his partner. The firm was called Marx & Co. of 84 Charing Cross Road. It was called Marx & Co. because they felt it sounded better and Marx and Cohen, his <laughs> partner's name. And his partner had no son either. So I was destined shortly before birth to run the bookshop. And every Saturday morning from the age of eight was taken into that shop and shown the latest acquisitions and told to study the price. The content was immaterial. The difference between the retail price and, and the, the price for which he had... Yes. Paid for the book. The markup, in fact. Which was phenomenal. <laughs> One particular Saturday, he showed me a copy of the Gold Bug, a first edition of the Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe. I knew nothing about Edgar Allan Poe. Glanced, glanced through the book in the hope of finding something interesting, and it turned out to be a book about something called Cipher. 
And it captured your imagination? Straight away. And I remember Dad saying that the price of every book, more than five pounds, is in the back, in code. So I managed to break his code. You went through school hardly noticing your school days, I think you said at some point, but they did notice you because they put you in a special form, didn't they? For troublemakers, wasn't it? Well, my first SOE operation was discovering that various public schools took their entrance examinations at different times. So we set up a system of intercommunication and we knew the papers in advance. So you were a spy from a very early age, weren't you? It was good training. Unfortunately, we were a little careless and earned ourselves such high marks, I was put in a very senior form. And the moment they saw how little I knew, I was sent to the bottom. And then asked to write an essay. Instead of writing on the subject I was commanded to write on, I wrote about schoolmasters who hadn't the imagination to set more interesting subjects. And the high master of St. Paul's, a very adventurous man, wanted to expel me, but felt I could have another chance, as he once had to someone called G.K. Chesterton. So I was allowed to stay on, studying what I wanted to study. And then when you left school, you offered your skills to the War Office, which was a considerate thing to do, your code-breaking skills, but they didn't want to know, did they? No. A lot of people were offering skills, and they were similarly turned down. They didn't know what to look for in a cryptographer. So ultimately, I had to approach a great friend of my father's, who was in the special branch at Scotland Yard. And he helped out? And oh, yes, he gave me an introduction with great reservations and reluctance. But there you were on uh, the, one of London's stations one day, being seen off by your mother and father, carrying a, a black market chicken in one hand and a bowler hat and a, a railway ticket in the other, and you were off to see the war, weren't you? From the, from the point of view of a cryptographer. You must have felt you had a lot to offer. I felt I had absolutely nothing to offer, whatever, and that was probably a reasonable estimate, because <laughs> when I was at this school for code breakers, I didn't like the methods of teaching and was far more concerned with devising codes than breaking them and tried to find methods of my own to break the codes they told us to break. You've described SOE as an open house for misfits. Yes. Why? Why? Because it was. It was. This country had never produced an arm of this kind where amateurs were obliged, told by church, to set Europe ablaze. And although we had the cream of the city of London and were run by Sir Charles Hambrough, head of Hambrough's bank, we were a bunch of trying. Gifted? In many instances, yes, though sometimes it was hard to decide at what. But fundamentally, the mission was to infiltrate agents into Europe and hopefully bring them back, sabotage agents. And they had very little idea of what would be safe communications. By being amateurish, do you think a lot of effort was wasted, or was it inevitable, given the fact that this was a totally new concept, wasn't it? We were professional at being amateurs. The loss of agents, the torture of agents, the mistakes agents made and the mistakes we made aged us rapidly, and by the end of 43, beginning of 44. We were professional enough not to want to take ourselves on if we had to. <laughs> it's like that uh, comment from another Marx, wasn't it? That you wouldn't want to be a member of a club that uh, would accept you. Yes. You broke a very notable code belonging not to the Germans, but to uh, General de Gaulle, didn't you? Well, yes, General What de was that? General de Gaulle disliked the British, and he had good reason to from his point of view. And in particular, he disliked SOE. But he finally decided he'd give his business to SOE on one condition, that he had his own secret code. He would let SOE know 
the contents of all messages passed in that secret French code. But what that code was, he would not tell us. Now, SOE agreed to this. Why shouldn't he have his own code? Poor bastard, he deserves it. So, every free French agent had two codes. One we gave him, one we knew nothing about. And they would religiously send us the clear texts of all incoming and outgoing messages in secret French code. I had no idea what it was. It would have been instant death in SOE to inquire. SOE honoured its obligations. According to de Gaulle, the secret of his code was locked in a safe. Well, I noticed that whilst British agents sent indecipherable messages, and we broke 90%, when the free French agents sent indecipherable messages, Duke Street took no action whatever to break them. And one night, a free French agent came on the air and sent a message and blew out his brains in the middle of it because the Germans broke in. And what he was in fact doing was repeating an indecipherable in secret French code. And the repetition was, was something you had The said Germans never intercepted do. it, broke open the door, and he killed himself. He never should have been asked to repeat that message. Duke Street should have broken it. And you broke it. Well, I locked the door of my office, and I broke the gold secret code. And the horror was, there was no secret code. He was utilising the already overworked British code and using it in such a way that we were not supposed to realise he was using it. It was a crying shame, wasn't it? It was a nightmare. So from that point onwards, I intercepted all messages incoming in secret French code. And if, if they were indecipherable, I re-encoded them accurately so that Duke Street could read their own messages. And in the end, this was discovered. And I will not. With the gruesome consequences. But, also but there were it. some. <laughs> there were some, and they abandoned the secret French code. Leo Marx, Eisenhower credited SOE with shortening the war by some three months. Mm -hmm. But you were determined after the war that you wouldn't go into the intelligence establishment at any cost. Why? Even when they said, well, this is the best way you could serve your country, they appealed to your patriotism, didn't they? Or yes. tried to but you wouldn't have it. There's an art in appealing to patriotism, isn't there? And I had to stay behind when SOE was officially disbanded to do a certain job. And realised that there would never be peace, I thought, lasting peace, as long as there were codes. I didn't think there'd ever be lasting peace and paradoxically then devised a code which looked as if it was an unclear message but in fact contained a top secret message that could not be read so that people could communicate in any language even if they didn't speak it. So you didn't want to be a cryptographer anymore? No. No. Because you thought it would be against the interests of your country? Against just wouldn't be peace. I had so wanted in the war, whilst briefing agents, to write a script called Peeping Tom. Which you did? Yes. After the war? Yes. It was about a psychopath, wasn't it? Who yes. Who targets women and looks at the fear on their faces. Yes, amongst other things. It was born in the briefing rooms of SOE. I it think. was born watching agents struggling with their codes. And fears. E yes, watching every mistake they made, every gesture, so that if they did make them indecipherable, at least I had a photograph of them. The, it turned into a film, and the film was a flop when it first came out now. But worse, now it's come back, hasn't worse, it? Tim than a flop. It was a disaster. It was made by a brilliant film director called Michael Powell. And it kept him out of work for 14 years because the critics so loved it. One critic in particular, most distinguished lady, called Dennis Powell, 
came up to me at the press show and said, don't you do that again. <laughs> but now, the she, young people in America have come back to it, haven't they? It's popular. Well, it? Martin Scorsese has suddenly turned it into a cult film. He's a great director. And he presented it some years ago and lectured on it. And America wasn't very interesting. Was it but your a week way, Leon Marx? I, I sorry. just want to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're running out of time. I want to ask you whether it helped you to lay some of the ghosts from the past. They will never be laid. Not those particular ghosts, because they aren't ghosts. They are realities. Every silk code has an agent's face to it. You talk about those silk codes as your children. You and your wife don't have children. Do you, is, is, that, is that really the way you think Well, without my it? wife, I never could have finished this book. She's survived ten years of hell while one recreated it. And all of these codes were used by resistance agents. To me, everyone has a face on it.